everyone. My name is Nabiha Musavi. Uh, thank you for joining us for the session today. Uh, we are hosting the session in collaboration with the Muslim Mental Health Consortium and ICMA Relief um, to address the domestic violence in our community. We have um, esteemed panelists, uh, Imam Arshad, who is the Director of Religious Affairs and Community Development at Masjid Jafar, John Creeks, uh, Georgia. We have uh, Dr. Farah Basi, who is an assistant professor uh, at the Department of Psychiatry, Michigan State University, and Dr. Savik Naveed, who is an associate professor of psychiatry and program director at ECHN uh, Connecticut. So uh, the agenda for today would be an uh, introduction to the session by Dr. Amber Huck uh, from ICNA Relief, and the send, and followed would be followed by sessions uh, by our esteemed panelists, um, by Brother Arshad, Dr. Abbasi, and Dr. Naveed. And we'll have question and question and answer session. So, without further ado, I'd introduce uh, Dr. Amber, and uh, he would take it from there. So, Dr. Amber is a national coordinator for Muslim uh, Family Services, Ikna Relief uh, USA. He's a psychologist by profession and obtained his master's and PhD from Michigan. After practicing psychology in Michigan for over 12 years, he switched to academia and taught as a professor of clinical psychology in five countries. Dr. Huck has more than 65 papers and nine edited books to his credit. He's also an associate editor of Muslim Mental Health Journal for more than 10 years and a researcher at the Muslim Mental Health Consortium based in Lansing, Michigan. So I'll Give it to Dr. Huck now. Dr. Huck, you can share your screen. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Yeah, I'm uh, sure you would agree that uh, domestic violence has always been an underrated and underreported crime. It comes in different types and forms, and it is mostly the females who are the victims. A uh, UN global study on homicide showed that in 2019, 34% of females were murdered by their intimate partners. What is domestic violence? It's causes and consequences on the victims, the family and the larger society. And what does Islam say about it? These are the questions we want to address today by a group of panelists. The panelists are highly qualified professionals in their disciplines, and we want to learn from them. I am the program director of ICNA Relief Muslim Family Services, which functions in six regions of the US, multiple states, and many cities. Many domestic violence victims enter and leave our 26 transition homes across America. We provide them shelter and empower them to become independent and productive citizens of society. Our mental health counselors help them to become independent and productive citizens. Mental health counselors in dozen plus and a growing number of states provide free of charge counseling to clients from every background, including non-Muslims. It was during COVID at the beginning of 2021 when one of our counselors ran group sessions for non-Muslim women who had relationship issues. And they thanked us for learning to manage their lives free of charge. The issue of domestic violence often because of compromised mental health, continues to haunt our communities. A very chilling case that led to this webinar is that of Ms. Sanya Khan, a 29-year-old South Asian woman killed by her husband in July, 2022. And then he allegedly shot himself and after murdering his ex-wife, so there are a growing number of such cases in our communities. And we tend to refuse to talk about them both professionally and openly because mental health topics are taboo for many in our communities. 
Yet such incidents happen daily and our youth and families continue to suffer. Unfortunately, there is also a growing number of suicide cases among Muslims in America. We should question if we are doing enough to know what ails our communities. We certainly do not want to remain oblivious and neglectful of others' crisis and wait until, God forbid, the same scenario strikes our own homes. Ikna Relief Muslim Family Services and Muslim Mental Health Consortium based at Michigan State University joined hands early this year to address issues like these in public forums. We hope that we will learn from our panelists and continue to host such webinars in the future. <clears throat> I encourage the audience to ask questions after panelists deliver their talks. Thank you for joining us. Over to you, Nabiha. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Huck. Uh, now I would like to uh, invite our uh, panelists, Brother Arshad Anwar, and uh, I would share my screen as well. Brother Ashraf is an uh, author and educator and community leader serving the greater Atlanta area. He holds a bachelor's in Islamic sciences from the International Islamic University in Islamabad, Pakistan. He also holds a master's in educational leadership. He serves as an advisory board member of ETHAR, a nonprofit that serves refugees and underserved families. He also serves as a board member for No Family Services, a nonprofit that provides legal aid and support services to victims of domestic violence. Brother Ashrad belongs to the same region and area where these incidents uh, that Dr. Huck mentioned had happened. So I would give it over mm -hmm. to Brother Ashrad um, from here. Thank you. All right. Zakmullah khair. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi everybody. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi. Alhamdulillahi. Kithira tayyib al-barakin fihi. Wa salatu wa salamu ala shraf al-anbiya al-mursaleen wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in wa ba'd. We begin by sending our praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we also send our peace and blessings on our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I wanted to address, you know, take this opportunity to just talk about uh, the, the spiritual and religious perspective on some of these issues that we deal with in our community. Uh, and that is because there is a multifaceted approach to dealing with these situations. We need, uh, you know, at times intervention at legal level. We need uh, the intervention from our mental health professionals. And we also need intervention from community leaders to give a stern and strong message to our community uh, about the dangers that that face people. People's lives are literally at risk because we uh, attach stigmas and we refuse to acknowledge certain very disturbing behaviors uh, that start off uh, at, a, at, a, at a much lower level that eventually reach up to this point where people start hurting each other. And the, we're talking about domestic violence, but I want to share some religious perspectives on uh, the idea of approaching mental health as a, as a normal part of, of, of our lives. And what we understand from the religious scripture that we have, so the Quran, the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, the terminologies we come up with now are, are terminologies that, that, that develop over time. But the concepts that those modern day terminologies address are the exact same concepts that are being brought up uh, in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So mental health, uh, so, uh, surprisingly for maybe uh, many of our cultures and communities, is a, is a topic that is just all over the Quran and it is uh, addressed by the Prophet Sallallahu in just so many ways. We just, back then, they didn't refer to it as mental health. Today, that's the, 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 the proper name that we, give, uh, that we give the topic. And I want to share some of these uh, hadith that most likely our community is familiar with, but we have to put the perspective on what is the Prophet Sallallahu trying to achieve when he shares these things with us. And one of these uh, narrations is a very popular narration that may be used in other contexts. And that is when the Prophet ﷺ said, kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an That uh, each and every single one of you is a shepherd. And each and every single one of you is responsible for their flock. 
And that word responsible means that you are eventually going to stand in front of Allah one day and answer for the people that you were responsible for. And so if you belong to a family and you are a parent, you are responsible. Uh, you're responsible for each other as spouses. You are responsible as a parent. You're responsible as a sibling. Uh, whatever role you play in the family, you have certain responsibility. And the Prophet Sallallahu detailed, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, he said a, a governor is the imam, uh, is, is responsible for his community. And he will be responsible for, he will be questioned about the things that he did and, and so on and so forth. And when we usually look at this, we, we try to understand that there is there are rights that people have. So if I am a head of a household, I have to make sure my family has a place to stay. I have to make sure they have food to eat. I have to make sure. And then here's where we get into some of the you know cultural side. I want to make sure they have access to education. I want to make sure they have access to safety, so on and so forth. And if anybody in my family gets hurt, then I am responsible for making sure that they get treatment. So if somebody gets sick, I should take them to the doctor or I should, you know, find out what medicine they need or so on and so forth. And this concept of taking care of your family is the exact same when someone is suffering from a, a mental illness. So if let's say somebody is becoming isolated, somebody's becoming depressed, somebody has severe anxiety or whatever is happening. Those things also, we are responsible as, as parents for addressing amongst our children or amongst our, uh, you know, uh, no matter how old you are. So if the child is old, like you're, you're, you're an adult, but we in the family are responsible for making sure that we're taking care of each other. And this is a perspective that we we absolutely must understand when the prophet says we are shepherds and responsible for our flock. then that means every area of our lives, not just the ones we pick and choose or the ones that are convenient or the ones that are most easy uh, to take care of. Oftentimes, uh, issues like this are not easy to take care of. If we know someone in our family that has anger issues, right, that's a mental health issue. And anger is a topic uh, addressed in the Quran over and over and over again. The Prophet ﷺ teaching us how to deal with anger, what to do, what are some of the things we can adopt, and, or just at least understanding that having anger and rage and then letting it out on, on people and hurting them, this is a horrible, horrible thing to do. And so at least starting from that perspective. But things uh, that, are, that are of this nature are the things that develop into worse and worse uh, crimes and and you know lead people to do horrible things if they don't take care of it themselves or get someone to help them take care of it then they're going to have uh, serious problems i want to also share another hadith the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said ma anzala allah da'an illa anzala lahu shifa that allah has not sent down any illness any illness except that allah has also sent down its shifa its cure meaning whatever and we, we usually apply this to physical illnesses but in you know our tradition, we have something that we call diseases of the heart. So even the scholars from a long, long time ago, they identified spiritual illnesses, what we can call a mental, mental illness as well, but spiritual illnesses as diseases. And they utilize this, uh, this perspective that if Allah has created an illness, then Allah has also given us its cure. And so the spiritual diseases like anger and jealousy and hatred and all of these types of things are treated as illnesses by our spiritual tradition. And then the cure is presented as well in often what could be described today as psychotherapy or counseling or, or therapy in and of itself. When you go, and you try and, and figure out what's bothering you, why it's bothering you, what is the root cause, then how can you change it? This is something that has been happening for centuries, especially in the Muslim tradition. We just refer to these things with different terminologies over time. And it's it's all part of the same, uh, same family of things. And so if Allah has created an illness, then there's a cure that is out there. It's up to us to go and find it. And oftentimes, again, for these spiritual illnesses or these mental illnesses, the cure lies in. Uh, those that are, uh, you know, uh, getting these uh, professional training in, in counseling and therapy and psychiatry, psychology, these are the fields that study uh, human behavior. And when you couple that with your religious tradition, you have a beautiful shifa, you have a beautiful cure, uh, your religion that gives you your foundation, and then the practical steps and, and techniques that help you overcome some of the things that you are uh, that you're facing in life. There's also uh, a beautiful narration from the Prophet wasallam, in which he mentions that rights of a Muslim, the rights of every single Muslim that they have on each other. And this is a very beautiful thing. Again, if we see it from the perspective of what it's trying to do. And again, in our uh, current context right here of, of mental health and, and community care. So the Prophet, وسلم, he said, Muslimi al -Muslimi, khams, 
uh, that there are five rights that a Muslim has over another Muslim. And in one narration, he mentions six. Uh, there are six rights that a Muslim has over another Muslim. But these rights, he says, they are that uh, uh, salam, that when somebody initiates the salam or you meet another Muslim, that you greet them with assalamu alaikum. And again, you can think about when the Prophet is saying people have rights over you, you would expect something that we would perceive as more serious. So things like, uh, you know, don't harm other people, uh, don't steal their property, even though these are also obviously rights, legal rights that they have. But in this particular context, he's mentioning some things which might be overlooked in community life. So he's saying when you meet somebody, you say salam. And when someone says salam to you, you return their salam. So greeting is a right that Muslims have over each other. And then he mentioned ayadatul marid, that visiting the ill person, someone who is not feeling well, visiting them, going to them, giving them company, this is a right that a Muslim has over another Muslim. Tiba'ul uh, janaiz, when a person passes away and their janaza, their funeral is being carried, following and participating in that janaza service, in that funeral service, is a right that a Muslim has over another Muslim. He mentioned ijabah to da'wa, that when somebody invites you to their house, uh, invites you to come and have a meal with them, that you should respond to their call, right? If you, there's no reason why you should isolate people, but if they're inviting you, go and be social and, and, and respond to that call. And he also mentioned when they ask you for advice, when somebody reaches out to you and wants some advice, that you give them advice. And finally, he mentioned uh, Tashmitul Atis, which is really interesting, that when a person sneezes and they say, Alhamdulillah, that you respond to them by saying, Yarhamukallah, may Allah have uh, mercy and compassion on you. Now, these are really interesting. You think, you look at these, where is the Prophet Sallallahu trying to go with this when he's giving us these things as rights that people in our community have? Returning the greeting, visiting people when they're sick, following their janazah, uh, giving advice when they need it, uh, responding to them with dua when they when they sneeze, and answering their invitation by attending that which they're inviting you to. And this is really creating a foundation for a, a not just spiritual, but a mentally healthy community, right? Because this is the opposite of allowing people to be isolated. And so when somebody says salam to you, they're greeting you, but nobody responds to them, right? And oftentimes, you know, I've, I've spoken to people that are also contemplating uh, suicide. And sometimes they'll say things like, I just wish somebody would listen to me, right? I just wish I had somebody I could, I could talk to, or I wish somebody would just smile at me. And so the Prophet ﷺ is encouraging this behavior, this community behavior. Say salam to people, greet them, and obviously ask them how they're doing and, you know, extend that, that conversation. When somebody is ill, visit them. So we usually think of this as, oh, they have the flu or they got COVID or, you know, they broke their arm or their leg and let's go visit them because they're in the hospital. But this also applies, again, to any kind of illness. And so when a person is not showing up, and this is something that was in the, the community of the Prophet ﷺ, if somebody who was regular at the masjid would not show up, he would send for somebody to go and check on them to see why they didn't show up. They usually are always here. Why aren't they here? So when people's social behaviors change, then they are to be followed up with and checked on to see if they are okay. And so this is something the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to do. When somebody is not showing up, they're not calling, they're not responding to your texts, they're not uh, as present as they used to be. Something is different. Something is off. Somebody should go and check on them and make sure everything is okay and sit down with them. We have this saying in English, right? Misery loves company. Nobody really wants to be alone, but they don't feel like they can uh, they can reach out to somebody. Following the janaza, so the following of the janaza, uh, it it doesn't do so much for the deceased person physically. Obviously, spiritually it does, but physically you're following the janaza so you can be in the company of the family of the person that is now grieving. That is now you know that they might be facing anxiety, depression, sorrow, confused. Uh, they don't know what's going to happen next. Maybe they'll have some financial difficulty. So the people are encouraged to go to the janaza to comfort the family, to be there for them, and then also to find out if there are any needs that need to be taken care of. And this is all about taking care of the spiritual and mental health of of individuals. Responding to an invitation, maybe somebody wants you to come to their house. Don't isolate people. Go to their house. Spend time with them. We're supposed to be a socially active community. When people ask you for advice, give them advice or lead them to someone that can give them advice. This is a, a very important point we have to obviously bring up. As imams, we're not trained uh, psychiatrists and psychologists. So when things get very, very serious, we need to refer clients or people over to professionals that can help them with uh, with those tactics. 
And then the last one, which I always find interesting, and somebody sneezes and says, Alhamdulillah, you respond by making dua for them. And again, this is at the very basic level, the Prophet teaching us, remember each other in your duas, right? Remember each other in your duas. When somebody sneezes and they say, Alhamdulillah, it's an opportunity for you to connect with your brother or sister and just say, Alhamdulillah. And it's a, it's a spiritual exercise. We treat it like it's just a ritual, right? Somebody says it, we'll just say it back and we go on with our lives. But what's happening in that moment is something really beautiful. You're actively asking for Allah's compassion and mercy to be given to this other person. And so there's a connection that needs to, needs to kind of happen here. But you look at these narrations, specifically this last one, and you see that the Prophet Wasallam is laying a foundation down for community life that is supposed to make us uh, more involved with each other. And one of the things I always like to tell my community is, you know, whenever we have these teachings about being kind and compassionate to others, the first and foremost people that deserve that treatment from you is your family. There is no one that is more important in your life than your immediate family. And so if anyone in your family is not getting your attention, you're not, you're not talking to them, uh, you're not uh, finding out what's bothering them, if they're ill or sick, or if their behaviors are changing and you're not checking up on them, this is your first and foremost responsibility is to check up on the people in your family and then outside of that circle as well. But really, it's it's a very clear perspective, and there's just so much in, in the Quran and Sunnah that we can go into, but there's so much of it, all of it reinforcing the fact that what we today call mental health is what the Prophet ﷺ referred to in different, uh, you know, a hadith, and, and in different ways, he was doing, he was accomplishing the same goal, that we're aware of what's happening. When you had uh, instances of domestic violence in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, he would immediately ascend the minbar. And he would, uh, he would rebuke uh, the men in his congregation and call out their behaviors and say, how is it that you're behaving this way? He dealt with their anger. He dealt with the, you know, the, the, their behaviors that were violent, people that were prone to you know, acting and, and uh, acting out and hurting people. The Prophet ﷺ criticized them. He sat with them. He gave them this entire uh, religion, which is supposed to change you know, who you are from the inside to be a better person. And I'll close with this that the Prophet ﷺ said, that I have been sent only to perfect good behavior, good behavior. And so, you know, every single thing that the, the Quran and Sunnah tells us is good behavior. Everything opposite to that is bad behavior. And obviously, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling us that you're responsible for taking care of your family. If you are the cause of hurt and pain to your family, then you are doing the exact opposite of what the, our beautiful Prophet وسلم, was sent to teach us uh, to do. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his help. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to allow us to open our hearts and to really dig deep down inside of ourselves to understand that we are the ones that need the change and, and to you know make sure that we don't fall into this trap of, of victim blaming and then trying to find excuses for people when they act in these negative ways. And you know, sorry, one last thing I'll mention, I think it's, it's important mentioning from a religious perspective. Victims of domestic violence are often told to have sabr. Sabr means restraint. And the, the script is completely flipped. It is the person that is perpetrating the violence that should be told to have sabr and restrain their behavior, not the person that is, that is, that is suffering. And it is completely the opposite of what uh, the Prophet ﷺ has been teaching us. The person that should have restraint is the one that's acting in a negative way, uh, not the person that's, the person that's suffering has a right to uh, do whatever they can to get out of that uh, that suffering and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal for his help. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Brother Rashid, for an insightful discussion and highlights of this topic from the religious perspective. Um, I would like to introduce our next panelist and Dr. Farah Basi. Uh, is our next speaker. Dr. Abbasi is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Michigan State University and a core faculty member of the Muslim Studies program. Her areas of interest are cultural psychiatry and teaching medical students how to provide culturally appropriate care to Muslim patients. She is the founder director of the annual Muslim Health Conference and director of the Muslim Mental Health Consortium Michigan State University with whom we have collaborated for this uh, webinar. She has served on many boards um, and committees, including Council on Minority Health and Health Disparities in American Psychi uh, Disparities in American Psychiatric Association. She currently chairs the Mental Health Task Force for
for the mayor of Lansing, Michigan. I welcome Dr. Bossi. Uh, Thank you so much, and uh, assalamu alaikum to all our uh, uh, attendees. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Jazakallah uh, to Brother Arshad for setting the stage. I was hoping, can we upload my yes. PowerPoint? So I will go through it really fast. And the idea of creating this PowerPoint is that everybody gets to uh, have the, these uh, points and uh, kind of uh, this has a lot of resources and references. So first of all, I really want to start with that domestic or intimate partner violence is a moral, ethical, social failure. And it transcends age, gender, uh, socioeconomic status, education level, as we are finding out. No culture, no community, no uh, environment is immune to it. Um, so, but the focus of today's discussion is that this rising incidences of these happening in our own uh, community, where we are, like Brother Ashur set up, that way, where we are followers of a religion, which does not allow you to even get angry, where mental wellness is integral and central to you being a practicing Muslim. So, like alcohol or any other substances that can impact your decision-making capacity is prohibited and inhibited in uh, Islam. Same way anger is seen as in that category. So why, why a religion which is uh, quintessentially feminist, which is infused with the spirit of respect for a woman, why are we seeing these incidences happen around us? And we read about one just yesterday happening in Pakistan, which is really disturbing. So uh, as much as we have to look at domestic violence in a broader perspective of the causes why this is happening, but we also have to go inward, look at our culture distortions or where are we not following our religion? And that's the goal here today. So the United States Department of Justice defines domestic violence as a pattern of abusive behavior in any relationship that's used by one partner to gain or maintain control over another intimate partner. So it can be intimate partner, it can be. And okay, next. Violence that occurs within the private sphere, gen generally between individuals who are related through intimacy, blood, or law. Gender-specific crime, it could be the abuse of a child, an older relative, or other family member. It is a strong form of control and oppression. It can be verbal, mental, physical, sexual, emotional, social, spiritual, and economic abuse. And we are also now social has become a big issue because of the cyber bullying. It can happen to anyone. Let me repeat that. It can happen to anyone. It can happen at home or outside the home. It causes fear, harm to the body, mind, and spirit. Domestic violence against men is always not easy to identify, but it can be a serious threat often not reported, often not reported. Let me repeat that. And why? Because of the stigma, the shame, the guilt that we perpetrate on the victim. Going forward. Yes, I know we, we argue as a, a religious community, as a faith-based community, as a cultural, very close-knit community, we argue that this is a Western problem. It doesn't impact us. And I do agree that when we talk about it here in these forums, the concept that immediately comes that, oh, Islam is patriarchal, or we are coming from these oppressed communities. So we have to walk away from this Western feminism, which has colonized the word oppressed and empowered and has made itself an authority. We are Muslim women are painted as oppressed and abused without any agency. So definitely, when we look at domestic violence rate, it's prevalent and equivalent 
in uh, outside the community. So yes, we have to walk away from that notion, but that doesn't mean we are not going to take onus of our own responsibility in this. Silent to salient. Muslim woman is not silent. And why we are focusing on women? Because we are seeing increasing crimes because women are tend to be more victim of this intimate partner violence or domestic violence. That's why we are going to focus on the women issues right now. Women, Muslim woman has to become from silent to salient, central. Because Islam recognized women's full personhood prohibited female infanticide, given, give women right to own property and to divorce, right? On a, and while we see in American and Western societies, it took them just a few years, till a few years, women did not have that right or win a citizenship or a personhood going forward. <clears throat> Let's look at this problem from Islam's point of view. In Islam, the word used most to describe God, the highest and the most exalted being in existence, are intrinsically feminine. What is interesting about these words are that their origin, rahim, the root of rahma, the biggest quality, you know, bismillah, rahman, the rahim and rahman, right? The biggest qualities that we associate with the God, its root is rahim, which means warm, uterus. <clears throat> the word is deeply associated with femininity, motherhood, and quite literally the anatomy of female body. So if he's the creator, he gave the power to procreate to women. And that's where the woman's role is central in Islam, where men's role is to protect and nurture this woman. <clears throat> Mind you, not to control, but to protect. God's guidance through Quran always is, uh, and please disclaimer, I'm not a religious authority. This is just my perspective and understanding why I uh, feel empowered as a Muslim woman. This is my findings, my research. So people might say that I, I'm no religious authority, but this is why I feel very proud to be a Muslim woman. God's guidance through the Quran always is addressed to his believers, both men and women. It doesn't say that women do this and men just control. Women dress properly and men, you do whatever you want. Men, women be, be chastised and men is free to for adultery. No, equal, equal roles, equal uh, responsibilities, equal, uh, I mean, Quranic verses uh, addressing both. Uh, we can go. <clears throat> Next. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. So each has this concept that man, Jannah would be full of man and woman has to struggle to get to Jannah. No, anyone who follows Quran, who follows Hadith, who follows God, is gonna, righteous of you, is going to be in Jannah, irrespective of your gender. To whoever, male or female, does good deeds and has faith, will, will shall have a give, give a good life and reward them according to the best of actions. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in 17th, 7th century made it pursuit of knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim, again, male and female both. But then how is woman celebrated? He only celebrated birth of daughters. And he also mentions heaven lies under the feet of your mother. What big role, important it is to, and what we are seeing in intimate partner violence, that while you are pregnant, you are, you are more prone to this violence. You become, people uh, tend to hurt you more when you are pregnant. So how contrary to our beliefs. Umbarak, okay. That's fine. We can go. Next. This is a, from a jurisprudence text, uh, uh, Islamic jurisprudence text. She's free to require her husband to, to sign a prenuptial agreement. The prenup not only includes any money she will receive in the event of a divorce, but also contains any Islamic rights she wishes, wishes to enforce for herself. 
the right to a divorce, the right to keep custody of her children if there is a divorce, the right to continue her education, right to work, right to wear a head covering or not to wear a head covering, the right to be the one and only wife, right to be one and only wife. Please remember that. Forbidding her husband to take any other wife while he's married to her or whatever other issues most concern her. I'm not making this up. This is from uh, jurisprudence, like a legal uh, document. We can go to next. We also see Hazrat Khatija, who was also the first Muslim in Islam. Why? Prophet could have gone to anyone to confirm his prophethood, to validate his prophecy. Why? Why turn to his wife? Why does the first Muslim becomes a woman? Khatija was the CEO of Makkah's largest and most successful uh, trading company at the time. And she proposed to uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And at that time, she was 15 years older than him, single mother, twice widowed. And she never gave up the job. Like the Prophet never asked her to quit her job and not be the boss and stay home, take care of the kids. She continued to be the entrepreneur of her business. We also know these honor killing, this female genital mutilation, these, these practices are pre preceding Islam. It has no role, not uh, any, nothing to do with the Islamic spirit. We also know that in days of prophet, women prayed in mosque, unsegregated from men, were involved in hadith transmission, gave sanctuary to men, engaged in commercial transactions, were encouraged to seek knowledge, were both instructors and pupils in early Islamic period. And please, I again say, this is my research. I'm not a religious authority, but this is what keeps my faith. This is what keeps me strong. Uh, now, the verse in Quran, and I was hoping that uh, Imam uh, Arshad would address this. So this is again very trans trans uh, translations from various uh, uh, religious authorities. So this is the ayah that's usually used to uh, beat vice and, uh, like you know, uh, this concept that men are supposed to control women. Let's look at it. Men are the protectors, protectors and maintainers of women because Allah has given the more strength than the other because they support them from their means. Therefore, the righteous women are devoutly obedient and guard in the husband's absence what Allah would have them guard. As to those women whose part uh, you fear disloyalty and ill conduct, admonish them first. Uh, then refuse to share their bed and last strike them lightly. But if they return to obedience, seek not against them means of annoyance for Allah is most high, great above you all. Um, again, first of all, this is given in the case a woman is bringing you disgrace, is cheating on you, is be in, is uh, in getting uh, involved in behaviors that might bring you shame or bring your family or kids and uh, endanger them. So first of all that, but let's look at the perspective of different imams on this ayah. Chronic verse to justify male dominance in the 34th ayah. Let me read this because I don't want to read it wrong. 34 ayah in Surah Al-Nisa, which is most commonly interpreted as men are the protectors and maintainers. Original word koamun, other possible interpretations could be advisors, providers of guidance of women. Because original bima, other possible interpretations and circumstances where they are superior to them. Original Fadala, other possible interpretations have a feature that the other lacks. And because original Bhima, other possible interpretation, they support them from their means. So there are so many interpretations. Let's go to the next. Verses 434 in the Quran prescribes a step-by-step -step process for husbands to address a wife's behavior if she's acting in a manner that would threaten the integrity of the family unit, such as promiscuous behavior, Arabic word that has often been translated as beat her, also could be taken in many other meanings, such as leave her. 
Scholars who choose the translation of beat emphasize that it is symbolic and can leave no mark or injury. These scholars suggest that the husband might use the equivalent of a tissue or a blade of grass. Abusers may take this verse out of context and forget the multiple teachings that emphasize equity, mutual compassion, and respect. So first of all, um, Islam is a very practical religion. And what we see is wherever there is a confusion, you turn to the life of the prophet like i love what umar Suleiman says keep it simple sunnah right have you ever seen a narrative or an incident with prophet when prophet would hit his wife we never see that prophet never raised voice never what we see prophet is actually participating in everyday chores taking care of the kids playing with the wife being uh, happy when he's home not bringing anger home so to me, and this thing, on one hand, you are saying that they are protector. Other hand, they're saying you have more strength. So you are not supposed to hit them. <clears throat> Even in worst conditions, because you are so strong and you can harm the other person bodily, you can leave a mark, better is to disengage and walk away. And this is what we are doing in domestic violence training, right? We are teaching them disengagement. And this is what Islam is saying, disengage. First of all, you it's not that you get food is not cooked and you will hit a wife or you she's not obeying you, you will hit a wife. Only if she's indulging in a behavior that you are, con are concerned about. But then also you move away, disengage, leave the bad. Then if you really have to admon admonish her, is again disengagement and prophet's life proves it time and time again that in moments of he's actually seeking advice of his wife he's actually he's his life is uh, defined by strong women surrounding him his wife his daughter so i think th this is something we really need to inform people that anger is not allowed. Anger is prohibited, literally prohibited. But secondly, you're not supposed to raise your hand to your wife or your kids or anyone dependent on you. We can go next. Again, same Surah in, uh, Nisa, just few verses down is talking about oh believers treat women with kindness even if you dislike them it is quite possible that you dislike something which allah might yet make a source of abundant good same surah is talking about it but why are we focused on one word which has so many connotations and meanings uh, we can go next Marriage in the Islamic context is a means of tranquility, protection, peace, and comfort, not to get the jahiz, not to get control, not to get a slave that uh, follows you. You have responsibilities. Both partners have responsibility to cre create this love and tranquility, not conflict, not anger, because when an action like that is taken, it just doesn't end there. It not only impacts you, your immediate family, it impacts the society. It, it, and that's what is happening right now. Our very fabric, it's getting completely unraveled by this anger, this misplaced uh, violence. <clears throat> Among his signs, he created for you mates from among yourself that you may dwell in tranquility with them. He has put love and mercy between your hearts. Verily, in that are signs for those who reflect. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam condemns violence against women by saying, How loathsome, ajeeb it is that one of you should hit his wife as a slave, is hit, and then sleep with her end of the day. Again and again and again. Stop, stop, stop. Don't, don't. Uh, next, domestic violence is under, and this is uh, again from our jurisprudence. Domestic violence is addressed at the concept of harm <clears throat> in Islamic law. Husband's failure to provide obligatory, and this is so important. Husband's failure to provide obligatory financial support for his wife, a long absence of the husband from home, husband's inability to fulfill his wife's sexual, emotional needs, or any mistreatment of wife's family members. 
Islam allows an abused wife to claim compensation under tahzir, discriminatory uh, corporal punishment, <clears throat> discretionary corporal punishment, sorry. I get very uh, affected by the topic. What we are seeing, we as a society have made it impossible for women to speak about it. And especially it is very hard to leave an abusive partner. It is frequently feel like you're failing or destroying your family, not trying to work things out, not giving your partner a second chance. This is what I want everybody to understand that that's why women find it so hard to leave an abusive relationship because <clears throat> it goes in cycles. The, the person in a, your perpetrator could just become really loving, sweet, and then, then there's a tension building phase, then something triggers, an abusive incident happen, then they feel guilty, they will again become really loving. So you start to internalize, you start to feel maybe it is true that it is something I'm doing that's triggering it. Maybe I should improve my behavior. Maybe I should stop uh, discussing things. Maybe I should be more uh, complying with finances, give him the control, give him the control. control. In the end, it becomes all about control. And we also know that COVID-19 is making it harder, right? The world's, uh, but also what we realized during COVID-19 that the world's formal econo economies and the maintenance of daily lives are built on the invisible and unpaid labor of women and girls. And this became very apparent during COVID-19. The job, the duties of the woman doubled because now they were teaching kids at home, they were taking care of husbands. And that's where we saw the number of cases of domestic violence quadruple world over. It became a global crisis. Just a slide, we can leave it, uh, go forward. Violence against women and girls is increasing globally as the COVID-19 uh, pandemic combines economic, social stresses and measures to restrict contact and movement. So you, now the victim and the perpetrator are, were closed in, in a closed space. So we did see this escalate, not only towards uh, women, but towards children, towards animal animals, pets. <clears throat> Crowded homes, substance abuse, limited access to services, reduced peer support were exhibited in these conditions. Before the pandemic, it was estimated that one in three women will experience violence during their lifetimes. Many of these women are now trapped in their homes with their abusers. So the numbers definitely doubled. Now, we as a South Asian society, because I'm in, from Pakistan and I want to really talk about it. Pakistan ranks as the sixth most da dangerous country in the world for women with cases of sexual crimes and domestic violence record recording a sharp increase. This is a study I found. The study finds that the home is the most dangerous location for women in Pakistan. Violence by an intimate partner, by other family members, for example, in-laws, parents, siblings, were the most common form of violence experienced with 24% of respondents experiencing one or both forms of violence in the past 12 months. Economic and social cost of violence against women and girls in Pakistan. Uh, this was the report. We can go. So let's look at, and I couldn't find uh, any latest numbers, but 50,000 women are killed per year from domestic violence with thousands of others maimed or disabled. So it is uh, such a huge issue that we are not addressing. Uh, patriarchal society, gender in inequality, most mixed victims of violence have no legal recourse, no legal court. Uh, the police does not register a case of uh, intimate partner violence. It's not considered a crime. I, I don't know if it has changed in recent timings. Uh, and then the limited women shelters, right? That's another issue. But these are some of the things I advise uh, a victim to do. Uh, seek medical care. The, this is for victims here, um, legal uh, numbers to contact, uh, finding support. Um, so 
and I'll leave it here and we can go. As a mental health provider, of course, women experience domestic abuse are more likely to experience a mental health problem like depression, anxiety, PTSD, substance abuse, suicide. Women with mental health problems are more likely to be domestically abused. So this is a vicious cycle. 30 to 60% of women with a mental health problem having exper have experienced domestic violence. Um, and like I said, uh, being pregnant uh, is also one of the vulnerable moments. Uh, but the story doesn't end there. Hurt men hurt men. Uh, and this is what uh, I'm, uh, Dr. Sadiq Navid would talk more about, that exposure to domestic violence abuse hurts children's self-esteem. They may not participate in school activities. They tend to isolate, difficult making friends, get into trouble more often. They also may have a lot of headaches and stomach. But the story doesn't end. If you have been exposed to domestic violence as a child, chances are that you will go on and perpetrate, become a perpetrator in uh, in your relationships. So, But I will let Dr. Sadiq Nabi talk about that. Again, in the end, I would summarize, there's not just one cause that why domestic violence happens. Various institutions are responsible for women's oppression, patriarchy, colonialism, racism, heterosexism, and capitalism. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Basi, for an insightful session. Um, the Rahma part was, it was something that really took me. Uh, and the understanding uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, being the protector, you know, the Rahim. So thank you for the session. Now we would move to the other uh, speaker uh, in our panelist. Allow me to introduce our next speaker. Um, Dr. Sadiq Naveed um, is an associate professor at Queen Park University and University of Connecticut School of Medicine. He is a psychiatry program director at ECHN Connecticut. So Dr. Basi, I would give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Nabia. Um, um, so just to give a little bit more introduction, um, my name is Sadiq Naveed, as Nabiya mentioned. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. And another thing is that I'm also fellowship trained in infant parent mental health. So the impact of the trauma and, and how it affects the, the, um, the, the development of the newborn, that's um, something I have the privilege to study. I think we are talking about a very important topic here, which is less discussed. And you know the and it is sort of a taboo to talk about trauma. And when I talk about trauma in today's talk, I'm referring to domestic violence. Um, it is a taboo, and most more commonly, uh, the women who are victimized or the victims of the trauma, they are silenced to protect the family, to protect the family secret. So I, I think we need to sensitized to the society that it's not okay to be traumatized. It's not okay for anyone to deal with the abuse. Now, what does it mean? And I'm going to take an um, a, a angle from psychology and, and, um, and human development on this uh, rather than Islamic view. I, I think uh, Brother Arshad and uh, Dr. Abbasi did a wonderful job on sharing the Islamic point of view from that. So what is it can be like, you know, uh, um, growing up in a in a household environment where your safety is threatened, where you feel always afraid and scared. So, uh, Nabia, can you share the video? And I want uh, attendees to share their in the chat, share their reactions in words when they see this. So, Nabia, can you uh, share the video on the shark music? So in the shark music, the first part of it is like you're in a really nice area and you know how much that can be enjoyable. And the next part is there is a background noise and how does it make you feel? Um, and I, I just want all of you to share your reactions to that. Can you see my screen, Dr. Reed? Yeah. 
Can attendees see that? Please raise your hands if you can. Throughout history, we've struggled to get it. So, so Nabia, um, can you um, Google another one? I think it's not the right one, but let's go to still face one while you search for that. Okay. So the name, what you're gonna search for is shark music, circle of security. So it should be nice view. So let's go to still face. So still face is a video showing a mother who struggles with any sort of mental health illnesses. And in this case, just think of a mother who struggles with trauma, whose safety is jeopardized every day and how afraid that she feels and how does it affect the growing children. Nabia, can you play? Sure. Uh, please let me know if you could if you can hear on your end. So. so here is this mother. She's smiling at the baby. Baby is responding. And now see, she, she has phone in her hand. She's not paying attention to the baby. So think of a mother who is not, you know, because of the trauma is not able to pay attention to her baby. Just look at the response of the baby. So there is some startling in there. He tries to engage mom, but mom is not really there. He's trying to look away from the, from mom. Nabia, can you fast forward to last part? I just want to see if, you know, okay, right there. So now mom starts responding back to the, to the baby. So just see the facial expression that changes for the baby. He is frightened right now, doesn't want to engage. So I want you all to share your thoughts after seeing this video. Nabia, can you take it down? Thank you. So how would it make a baby feel when mother is traumatized and her um, safety is jeopardized when she cannot really pay attention to the baby, the growing baby. Now, what it can be like for the baby to grow up in a traumatic environment or in an environment where they witness domestic violence. Do you have that video, Olivia? Doctor, um, maybe the one that I have on... That's my... okay. That's okay. So I want you to Look at this video, it's on YouTube, it's called Shark Music, Circle of Security. I can share the name here. So in this video, first part of the video is there is really nice, you know, uh, beat scene and, uh, you know, it's, it's really calming. And then there is a shark music at the background. And that feels really annoying and threatening. Rachel was a science teacher and she is fed up. This That's gonna be Olivia. We can. We don't have to share that. So, so just look at that, and how does that make make people feel when they're growing up in a threatening environment? Now, to measure the impact of the trauma, there was a very important study that was done a few years back, and it was towards adults. Um, and I think it has some important lessons for us. It's called a study. It was childhood experience studies. The it it. it focuses on a lot more adversities than just the trauma or domestic violence, but it shows again and again when the number of adversities increases, it increases the risk of mental health illnesses, psychological issues, physical illnesses, and those people who have faced this. Now, going back to what it means for someone who grown up in, an, in a, a traumatic household or chaotic household environment, what happens for babies in early ages, especially during infancy, infancy, toddler years, and even afterwards, baby knows that mom's gonna take care of her or him, mom's gonna feed her, mom's gonna meet her needs, and dad is a good loving figure. And I'm here to stay. This world is so much to me. 
But because of the trauma, his sense of the world changes. He knows that this place is not a safe place for me. And and this world does not mean to uh, is not well, uh, meant well for me. Now, how's it going to impact growing up for him? So just just keep that in mind. Um, and we in, in in psychology language we call it attachment. Um, and you know there are different ways people can respond. Now, this is this is when kids are being raised in a traumatic environment. Now, let's see if. A, a kid who struggled with the trauma as growing up and he becomes a father and then he wants to raise his kids and he means very well but because of his lingering emotional and behavioral issues his kids gonna be affected with that we know from the studies in genetics the concept of epigenetics trauma domestic violence it impacts the developing brains and it brings mutation to them. It changes the neuronal circuits. And it also impacts the, you know, offsprings or babies of the victimized, you know, adult who ha was abused or who grow, grew up in a traumatic environment. He's, he does not have direct connection that, that the, the baby of the uh, victimized father. But because of the uh, you know, uh, the rating environment and also epigenetic changes, he is also at higher risk of depression and anxiety. And this has been proven from Holocaust studies. In Holocaust studies, the survivors of Holocaust who survived and generation after generation, there was an impact of the trauma that they had, their uh, ancestors had to deal. So, the, the trauma, the abuse, the violence, the cycle, it does not go, it does not just stay there. It becomes a cycle. So we do need to break that cycle. And some of the tips I'm going to mention, and Dr. Abbasi also briefly mentioned on that. Now, how does it impact, you know, a growing child? Because, you know, they they feel like the, the, the growing infant feels like that this world does not mean well for them they have a poor sense of self-esteem. That can lead to depression, that can lead to anxiety. Sometimes individuals or kids cannot express their emotions and they manifest you know, behavioral problems and behavioral issues like aggression, uh, re recreational drug use, unprotected sexual behaviors. And that puts them at more risk of um, uh, the 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 the, uh, the physical abuse or domestic violence, and uh, Dr. Abbasi rightly mentioned that they can be a perpetrator of violence in future because that that's how they know how to deal with the trauma, uh, or how to deal with the, in relationships. No, it does not give them an excuse to become an abusive husband in the future. But I'm just telling you that we do need to break this cycle of violence. And then let's, next part is social emotional development. Now, I, you know, if I'm raised in a loving environment, I know how I need to react to other people, how I need to associate with other people. But if I'm raised in a traumatic environment, I'm going to do same thing with other people. And that's how I'm going to, because this is not what I know. I don't know anything better. And then studies after studies. So, 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 so we talked about psycho, psychological, social, emotional piece of it. Now, it also impacts the physical health, like obesity, heart diseases, lung diseases, you name it. It also increases the risk of those physical illnesses. Now, I think um, I, I want to, and you know, um, some of the tips that I want to share. The first part is prevention. As a community, when Hillary Clinton said it takes a village to raise a, as a child, it does take a village to raise a child. So as a community members, when we see that violence, we need, do need to report it to appropriate authorities. When you see a kid being at high risk of the domestic violence in the environment, and also you know, being at, at risk of physical abuse or being physically abused, in U.S., you can call uh, Division of Children and Family Services, and it's not that if you if you you know um, reported an error, they're just going to take away that kid. They do their own investigations. It's our job to you know 
report that and, and try to break that cycle of violence. Next thing is education. We need to talk you know, with the victimized uh, individuals. A victim, and in most cases, it's, it's the female, it's the woman who gets victimized. Educate them about resources, educate them about the impact of the trauma. Now, I'm taking psychology point of view here. I, I think it's better to raise a kid with a single loving parent than being in a family unit where one of them is extremely abusive. So I just want to say that out loud. And then last but the last last least but not last part is, or however you say it, is the treatment part. There are very effective treatment options. There are faith-based treatment options, but there are also treatment options that are built from psychology and psychiatry, you know, school of thoughts. There is psychotherapy. And when we think of psychological problems, think of them as a, as a, as a marathon. It's not a sprint. So it's going to take time to undo the impact of the trauma. And then medications are there. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. If have, I, sorry, I didn't have a PowerPoint. I just need to uh, have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor, uh, for your insights on the child perspective, um, and to all the panelists for their time. So I do see Doctor Umberhook um, raising his hand, and I would let him ask a question. Okay, Jazakallah khair uh, to all three panelists, mashallah, for your enlightening uh, presentations. Uh, Jazakallah khair. Uh, what uh, Dr. Farah brought up on the topic of uh, Rahma, it reminds me of that hadith uh, when she talks about Rahma as a mother's loving quality and protection. That there's a had sahih hadith about uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Bukhari about Allah has kept 99 parts of his Rahma to show to his servants on the day of resurrection. So that quality attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues more so for Muslims on the day of judgment, inshallah. So uh, that was very pertinent and yes, it did touch the hearts of everyone here. Uh, I have a questions for mashallah, all three of the panelists, small questions, but hopefully uh, they could address this. For Imam Arshad, what role can the Imams play in educating our communities uh, about mental health? And how can uh, the Imams and the professional community engage with one another to address the growing challenges for American Muslims and especially for the youth? So there are two parts of this question, hopefully uh, both will be addressed. And if you allow uh, Nabiha, I could also give uh, the questions for Dr. Abbasi and Dr. Uh, Navid, if it's okay. Sure, I mean, however, uh, the, um, you know, the panelists would like to take their questions. Uh, we do have some questions coming in uh, from the audience. Sure. We can. Yeah. So should I, or you want me to, let me just uh, give one question for Dr. Farad, then we'll go on uh, and ask the, the other attendees. So what it really also bothers me about the fact that there's so little, uh, not only awareness, but research studies on domestic violence and mental health issues in um, basic communities, Dr. Farah. So how do you suggest that the academia, uh, you being a professor, mashallah, and so is Dr. Sadiq, engage with humanitarian organizations like Ikna Relief, where we have got the, the data and we, we, we are on the grounds dealing with the uh, women who actually are affected by domestic violence. So what steps can we take to start, let's say, funded research projects so that we publish and get to know and educate people about uh, domestic violence and the mental health issues. I'll stop here. Maybe we can start with Imam Arshad. Yeah. Could you just repeat the, the two parts one more time, Dr. The role okay, of so imams. What role can the imams play in educating our communities about mental health? And how can the imams and the professional community so, for example, the uh, MMH, uh, for example, engage with one another, the, with imams, to address the growing challenges for American Muslims and especially the youth. Oh, no, very good. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, so, I think imams play a central role uh, in, in community life, 
for pretty much every single issue that 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 might pop up. I have a s- small book that I wrote a long time ago, t- uh, chronicling, um, uh, recording some of the, the the conversations, the difficult conversations that I've had with with community members in my office, and one of them was on the topic of uh, of, of domestic violence and abuse. And so we are usually, uh, and I believe in most communities for uh, Muslims, we're a first stop. Uh, where people come to and say, this is what I'm going through, this is what's happening. So it is absolutely important for imams to open up uh, themselves, to learn, to grow, to understand resources, to have a list of, uh, of, of resources. This kind of crosses over into your second part of the question. You know, My challenge to imams is, can you produce right now uh, a, a list of resources that you have on this topic that you would refer people to if you if someone came to you and said hey i'm going through an issue of domestic violence uh who is who are you going to reach out to for this person to get uh to, to safety for this person to get legal representation uh financial aid uh you know to, to escape the situation and so on and so forth so i have the, the the privilege to serve on the board of an organization that uh that does precisely this in the atlanta area which is Noor family uh, family services uh, and uh, it was the, the the executive director at the time that came and sat in my office, and, and it was Ramadan. And I remember she came and sat in my office and said, do you know that in Ramadan, we have more cases of domestic violence than outside of Ramadan, which was shocking. Uh, and the very next Friday, I got up and delivered a khutbah, and I, re- I repeated the exact words that she had told me, that in Ramadan, we're getting more reports of husbands or or spouses being violent with each other with with, uh, with, with each other than outside of Ramadan. We're getting more complaints in Ramadan. And the excuse is, oh, I'm hungry because I'm angry or this. And that. so the excuses were just limitless. But imams are, are serve a central role. The khutbah is uh, is is a very powerful tool that Allah has given uh, the imams in this in, in in our communities, and for us to wield it responsibly is 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 crucial. Uh, the issue is that you have an audience of hundreds of people uh, that have no choice but to sit there and listen to you. So, as an imam, your responsibility really should be: what is the message that needs to be sent to uh, to my congregation, to my people? And of utmost importance are topics that are that concern people's uh, safety, their lives, mm-hmm. uh, things that are. Ha- and the Prophet ﷺ used to do this all the time. He gave a khutbah specifically telling men. He got on the mimbar and he said, "What is the the, the narration that uh, that uh, Dr. Uh, Farah shared about? You know, how can you you hit your wife like a like a slave and then sleep with her?" He stood on the mimbar and he said that. He addressed a large group of people and he and he said that. So, imams need to take a more uh, 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 what do you call it? a direct approach, a more brave approach, and and for the imams out there, and I know, and I understand some situations that they might find themselves in. Uh, you know, they, many imams choose not to deal with this with these situations. They'll just turn people away and say, "Well, we can't help you at all," and that is uh, an incredible. Uh, you know, as the first hadith I shared, every single one of you is a shepherd, and you are responsible for your flock. So you, if you want to assume the position of imam, you cannot turn a blind eye to these things. If you are, you are not fulfilling your role as an imam. I don't know what you're doing, uh, but th- this is something that's extremely, and it's been it's been heartbreaking for me to see people turn away, people that are coming in in pain and are suffering, their children are suffering, and you know uh, the doctor just mentioned as well how this can become a generational issue. And now that we know all of this, and we still choose to ignore it and turn away, not th- this is a huge. Huge lapse that we're going to be questioned for in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So imams play a central role uh, and imams rely upon experts in our communities to come to us and say, here are the problems that are happening. Here are the things that you can uh, inform your community about. We have the skill and, and the audience to get up there and mention these things. And then people usually come to us as a first stop, and then we should have resources that are prepared uh, that we can turn people to. There are so many nonprofit organizations. And I will say this for any victim of domestic violence, you do not have to wait for a Muslim organization to help you before you get help. It's the most ridiculous thing I've, I've, I've had to deal with sometimes. It's and not in the area of domestic violence, but people come and they need financial help and we'll send them to... Um, a nonprofit that that provides financial help, and sometimes they'll say, "Well, they're not a Muslim organization," and so what? You need help. You need to feed your kids. You need to get help. So if you're in danger, you do not have to wait on Muslims to catch up in your community uh, to provide you that relief. You go and get the relief, or you get it. You go to the shelter that will protect you. You find the lawyer that will represent you. You do what you have to do because that is your 
right to have uh, to have that safety. And then when it comes to dealing with professionals, I think this is stuff like this is is, is a very good. This is this is public stuff that we do, but behind the scenes, you know, I I, I do have a resource, a, a mental health resource guide that was prepared by a local. Uh, mental health uh, uh, consortium. So the Muslim Mental uh, Muslim Wellness Foundation was they had a chapter here in Atlanta. They came to us and gave us a resource list. They compiled. They did the hard work. Compiled a resource list of you know Muslim professionals in the uh, in in our area because again that's the community's demand. This is Muslim professionals, but they did it. They did the work. They handed us the resource guide. So now whenever somebody walks into my office, I can hand them the guide, or I can say these are the people that I know. These are the people you can call. Uh, and then on the other side of if people cannot afford it, masajid collect sadaqa and zakat. They collect sadaqa and they collect zakat. Sadaqa and zakat is to be used for the benefit of our community. If somebody in our community cannot afford their legal uh, representation, if they cannot afford uh, you know, uh, the cost that will come with going to get counseling and help and therapy or whatever, Sadaqa and zakat can be used to fulfill those uh, to fulfill those needs. So we have all the resources in terms of uh, serving our communities. They're there. The, the outreach to get the message out that we are usually the first uh, the place people come to because they want to come to the message for help. We can provide them resources and we even can provide them with financial assistance. Uh, and then we have groups like ICNA as well that also provides financial assistance. So we're not lacking in any way, shape or form. It's just the the intentional choice to say, yes, this is our responsibility and, and we have to tackle these issues. And it's tough work. It's not easy work. But like I said, if you don't want to do this work, give the position to somebody else because this this is a position where you have to do the work. Thank you, Imam Rashid. Um, we... As far as uh, uh, the question directed to me and Dr. Naveed, I think uh, I would uh, <clears throat> defer it to the end like, because I want to get to the questions by the attendees. Yes. Um, so while Brother uh, Brother Arshad is speaking, um, one of the members in the audience, uh, Sister Rahila, shared that she's a clinical therapist in New Jersey. She works in a mosque as a clinical therapist. Uh, she herself and the imam provide counseling to the community. She provides the clinical side and the imam provides the spiritual counseling. Another uh, member in the uh, in the chat, uh, what Salah had shared that she wanted to make everyone aware that they have an organization in Michigan called My Family Services, right. which provides services and supports to the survivors of domestic violence. It's the only one of which supports the entire South Asian community in Michigan. And she's the president of the organization and would love to collaborate with the consortium and uh, now to understand and do more. And she also shared the website. Um, in one of the questions that uh, we have from the audience, uh, uh, there's a, one uh, attendee, her name is uh, Sundas Sabur. Sister Sundas has put out two questions. I would uh, direct one question to you, Dr. Abbasi, and then other one would be to Brother Arshad. So she says that unfortunately, the women also perpetuate uh, domestic violence. Uh, and, you know, for example, um, and it cannot be just the onus handed over to men. Uh, you know, mothers of abused daughters ask them to be silent. And it is how similarly mother-in-laws as well promoted. So what are your views about being in a com it being a community problem and not a personal family issue? So that's a question for you, Dr. Mm -hmm. So we know the research time and time again proves that, that the patriarchy is upheld by women as well. So these women themselves uh, kind of uh, support this kind of system. So this system is not in place just because of men. This is as much in place in, uh, uh, because the women support it. And I, when I talk of these issues, and I think I can refer back to uh, what uh, uh, the question was, that how can we do more work around domestic violence? The problem is the community infrastructure is not supportive. We, when we teach our daughters to remain silent or when we kind of turn a blind eye or we enroll of in-laws as a mother-in-law, sister-in-law, we, we, we become perpetrator of this crime as much, we, we are responsible as much, is because that's how we were taught that this is the norm, this is how things are. You know, these are the perpetrators. 
things that we have to really go to the root of the problem. It's not our religion that's doing it. It's, it's the culture that we have cultivated. And when we say the culture has to be changed, the woman has an equal, in fact, sometimes more role. But uh, coming back to uh, the question, I think we, until unless we create an openness, we walk away from the shame and the silence, this problem is not going to go away. The more we have these conversations would lead to collaborations, would lead to more communications. And that's where the research comes in. That's where the resources comes in. That's where these different organizations working can come together. But it starts, I always say one thing, individually, you, we all have to stand up and say for that, are we gonna be part of the problem or are we gonna be part of the solution? Very well said, Dr. Abbasi. Um, and the next part of the question that um, Sister Sundas asked would be towards um, Brother Arshad, which is that among the top 10 countries of which are dangerous regarding domestic violence, six countries are Muslim countries. My question is, what are the upstream approaches that can be taken at the community level to prevent domestic violence and how to operationalize those approaches? And before I give the mic to Brother Ashut, please, anybody who has any questions, type them away in the Q&A section. We are taking them as we go along. Thank you. You can well, take- you know, Just from a, from a religious perspective, there needs to be a reevaluation of uh, religious teachings versus cultural norms. You know, one of my uh, professors in the Islamic University, I won't mention which country he was from because I don't want to generalize uh, things here. But he said, you know, he said in, in, in a certain part of his country, if a woman talks loudly to a man, right, if she talks loudly to a man and it's in public, then until he slaps her in the face, he will not get his honor back in the eyes of the men around him. This is a Muslim country, a 90 something percent Muslim country that he was talking about. And this behavior is completely opposite to anything that Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have have taught us as a as a as a believing community that believes in a merciful God and so on and so forth. So what we have to understand is we have drifted away, right? We have allowed ourselves to drift away from religious norms, and we've adopted our own uh, responses and we've normalized them to the point where, like I said, if even imams are refusing to step in and, and help and sometimes are actually victim blaming and, and uh, you know, uh, defending the, the perpetrator culturally because those things are norms in their culture. So I don't really think, you know, I think we have a failure at, at some level of, uh, as Dr. Farah mentioned as well, there's a social failure of there's not enough people giving that clear message out there that this is not okay. What is wrong with this? So, you know, we also, we need a heavy approach. If, if, the, if the religious side of it is uh, not performing their duty to, you know, make sure to get out there and, and speak out against this, make this an issue, then we also need uh, the other side of it uh, to get out there and, and speak. And I actually would like to turn it over to Dr. Uh, Dr. Sadek here uh, about uh, what, what can, you know, what is it, what is uh, that, what does psychiatry look like uh, in, in some of these Muslim countries? And, and you know, are there, uh, what, what, what is the approach of, of Muslims themselves when it comes to going to our professionals in the mental health field? And, and maybe they can help us think about some of the more uh, oper, oper, operational side of, uh, of these things. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Sade for his, uh, his insight. Yeah, I, I think I will try to so loop answer to Dr. Hakchu when he asked about what should we be doing as a as a you know uh, experts in the field. I, I think you know there is a lot of research on that. There might not be research in uh, in Muslim uh, population, but there is a lot of research on impact of the trauma and how it is affecting us. Um, I think it's one thing that we can do is, and then I will go to the questions that being uh, that was being asked is um, our role of being an advocate as as an as a psychiatrist uh, as as a psychologist. Um, most of the Muslim countries in um, uh, that exist in the world uh, are developing countries or lower to middle income countries, right? Um, so there is not lack of enough support or resources 
First of all, I will give context of Pakistan. Pakistan today does not have any reporting services. Dr. Abbasi mentioned, you know, it is not easy to go to police. There is not even reporting services. Let's say if a, if a child is being abused, if a woman is being abused, who do you turn to? You don't, you don't have any place to go to. So first of all, and most recently, I think Zainab Alert bill came in context of the sexual abuse, but it really does not really address domestic violence. So as an as a community organizations, as an expert in the field, we should be out there advocating for these uh, uh, individuals, building laws, building protections in in the statute for for victimized individuals. This is this is a humane work, you know. This goes beyond Islam, right? Um, so first of all, I, I think you know advocacy, speaking out, writing blogs, writing in newspapers that this is not okay. Um, and other thing, you know, that that is the root cause that stems from it is that the, the, the economic dependence of women. So I think we do need to empower women that you are good enough. You can play an equal part in society by doing jobs or by doing whatever you want to do. Um, so that's that's another part, uh, part that I wanted to focus on. So. Um, I think there's tons of research, maybe not in Muslim countries. And uh, resources-wise, um, Brother Urshan, I don't have exact data, but at some point there were 350 psychiatrists in Pakistan. A couple of years ago, there were only four child psychiatry trained psychiatrists in Pakistan. And it, it, we shared this picture where, you know, we were having dinner together on one table were three or four friends who were child psych trained in the US. So this is the amount of resources that we have. So this is where advocacy working at playing in the part of, you know, role in politics and pushing for things that really matter can come a long way. Building on that. I wanna, that, I wanna to add that. to what you, uh, sorry, I just wanna add to what you said. I think we, we one of the things that we need to do is push our uh, communities to these, uh, to these fields. Uh, professionally. Uh, they're incredibly rewarding. Uh, you get to solve problems, help people, uh, create change in, in, in society. So I think that what you just mentioned, four, <laughs> total of four, that's 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 a huge lack of resources, especially with the number of population that we have in that, in that country alone. Uh, so building on that, the same thing that the six countries we talk about are very poor. They don't have, I mean, poor in the resources for mental health. None of these countries have good mental health infrastructure. That's one thing. We also, I, I think, interpretation of Islam, we need. Uh, basically, I think one part where I feel uh, also uh, is uh, how the religion is interpreted. There is one thing, Islamic culture, and then there is culture of Islam. Because Islam came to so many different countries, I think it has imbibed culture, local culture and cultural practice, which we think are Islamic, we have to have a good knowledge of Islam. And that's where the role of uh, theologian and sheikh and imams are, is going to be very important. But just one thing, I think Dr. Sadiq Naveed gave us a very, very important message that I really want to emphasize, which is that we have to stop the, talking about divorced homes as broken homes. We, like he said, that it is better for a child to be in a safe, loving environment with a single parent rather than um, being in an abusive relationship. Because I think 90% of women from our culture stay in these abusive marriages because they are told it's better for your kids. At least they have a father. It's, uh, or in, it can go both ways, uh, or a mother. I think that is what we really need to um, start talking about, that uh, it is okay, divorce is okay. Um, when we go to, again, our religious roots, Prophet's daughters were divorced too and remarried. Two of his daughters were divorced. So divorce was never, I, I think we have stigmatized divorce as well and have given this as a tool to the perpetrator to hang over a lot of mothers and women. So those are all, I think, issues that we really need to uh, focus on. 
Thank you, Dr. Basi, um, for answering this, this question. And I would just um, agreeing with your thought process that as women, we really need to help each other. We really need to be supportive to each other and not be part of the cycle, uh, especially being educated women. Um, unfortunately, the trends we see in particularly even in, in Muslim countries or here is that these are educated ladies who can be, you know, influenced by culture. And um, uh, I add to that quickly. So in Islam, we were not supposed to or allowed to judge each other. We have to take away judgmental approach and attitudes. Um, you have a day of judgment. In the end, it's, it, God is going to judge you on your actions. But we, we when, even when we are practicing, we think we are practicing Muslims and we think we, it's our right to then condemn others. Like you are not good enough. You are not good enough Muslim. You are not good enough woman. You are not good enough adult. We have to walk away from this judgmental attitude. And that answers your question, which was um, shared by Brother Shabazz Khan who said that how does one explain to someone, aka a female, that domestic violence isn't a norm? It, it, it is just part of a culture. So that, uh, if you want to add further to it, or I think that answers the- uh, Shabazz, it's gonna start with you. You becoming that model, the proponent for the woman empowerment, woman rights, fairness, justice, equity take it from any angle, but to you, it starts with each one of us and it starts with you. I agree. Um, Sister Aisha has um, shared that she works as a coordinator of Ikna Relief Transition House for women in New York. Uh, and there are a couple of things she tells South Asian women that they are not alone and they're here to support and help them. And, and they teach them to love themselves first before looking for someone else to love them so and Shabazz says got it Dr. Abbasi <laughs> <laughs> see you in Michigan soon all right uh, so Dr. Amber you could go ahead uh, with the question that you had for Dr. Naveed uh, if there are any other questions I can I uh, I think the one thing I also want to add is that for the woman, I think we also need a lot of pre-marital counseling. People have to understand it takes two to make this work. Uh, it's very unfortunate that even if men are divorcing women, women is hold responsible for divorce, like something you must have done to cause it and that's the myth that is perpetuated by men and women both that we really need to understand that marriage takes two it takes two to make it work and if the responsibility of divorce if not one-sided at least should be shared very true so i'll go ahead with my question for uh, dr sadik uh, navid i just uh Wondering about the fact that what cultural challenges, if there are, do you see in working with, mashallah, your uh, background with children and adolescent psychiatry, uh, the, 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 the cultural ch challenges with basic communities, and what message do you have for the counselors and social workers who work with such children? So I, I think, you know, I was um, expecting no more questions. It's 2.30 or 40, so I, I was all relaxed. You have to run. Okay. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Um, I, I can take on the question. I'm just uh, kidding. I, I think we, we are just having really... That's heavy, the basic thing. There's no time. <laughs> heavy, uh, heavy and dense conversation. These things are very challenging for especially people who come from non desi cultures to how to work with... Uh, the family values and culture of uh, people from our background. And for those counselors who are working with such children, they also grew up these counselors in American uh, society. And so they may not be very familiar with some of the daisy issues, especially of the new immigrants. Like we have all these refugees coming up here. We have several about 50,000 refugees just this year. So we are coming up with challenges of how to deal with people from different cultural backgrounds. What message do you give to the social workers and to the counselors who work with such people? 
Yeah, so I, I think you know this this um, needs uh, an approach of cultural humility. Sometimes you don't know. So uh, we long talked about cultural competency, and now we're thinking about cultural humility because you cannot know enough about a culture. So first of all, the, that point of being humble that you don't know enough about the culture. So be willing to learn on on the journey with this patient or uh, or with this family. So that's first thing. Second thing is, I, I think the importance of religion and what it means to uh, to uh, to uh, to the families. I, I think third thing uh, is um, the role of family and especially in laws or you know uh, um, grandparents. Um, we did this study in Pakistan, you know, or actually it's an ongoing study uh, where, you know, we observe the behavior of infants um, and, and moms bring them and we see how do we communicate with them. Most of the uh, mothers came with their mother-in-laws. So the, the, the concept, how we see family in, in, U in U.S. is different than how we see family back home in Pakistan or in, in some other countries. So what does family means to that, uh, that, um, um, that individual or that patient? I think the next thing would be, um, which is very uh, crucial is um, also a lot of these families have ingrained or uh, that, you know, viewpoint of mental illnesses uh, that these are that if you struggle with depression you are crazy if your kids have behavioral problems you did something wrong so be have, having a non-judgmental open approach towards dealing with the family and one thing that i always tell uh, you know the the trainees who work with us is go at the pace of the family and and be respect be respectful of boundaries how many how much they want to share with them but also needs lots and lots of psychoeducation. So uh, about some of the things that, you know, um, Brother uh, Arshad shared that how we uh, sometimes confuse culture with Islam. Think a lot of things are done in Pakistan that are not Islamic, but we, we view them as Islamic, uh, uh, you know, tradition. So I'll stop here. I think Dr. Farah Basi is, um, is an expert on this. Uh, so she may have additional thoughts. I just, oh, I thank you. Uh, just would like, like to say to I did, uh, perfectly. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I would just like to say to the audience, uh, if you have more questions, please, uh, to our panelists, please type them away. And while Dr. Vasi uh, would share her thoughts, I would let all the panelists to share their final thoughts and we'd take questions. So, and we would aim to close the conversation or end the webinar in the next 15 minutes. So go on. Okay. Oh, so we are continuing. Fifteen more minutes. Um, we would. Okay. I would see if we would have okay. some comments from or um, some questions. If not, we, we would just close uh, the the meeting or the webinar. So um, I think uh, I don't have to uh, anything more to add. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Sadik Navid said it very um, succinctly. Um, that uh, you have to meet the client where they are. Um, also, of course, we learn as therapists, as psychiatrists, that we have to check our own implicit biases. We, we can bring our own uh, values, belief system, prejudices, biases into therapy. And uh, that's something I see uh, happening. We, I just did a seminar where uh, a kid was bullied to the point he tried hurting himself. Uh, a refugee kid, and I, I get to hear comments like they don't allow their daughters to swim and things like that. I think you have to be patient. As far as uh, one thing I have seen, immigration in itself, even planned and out of choice is very traumatic. But especially when it happens to refugees or uh, evacuees or people who are kind of forced into these uh, displacements because of war or conflicts or uh, other foreign policy concerns, um, that it is harder. Uh, it's very interesting. I always talk about that, that um, if we bring any species to a foreign land, be it plant or animal, 
we prepare the soil, we prepare the environment for the species to in like kind of be able to take roots or breed. It's with only humans, we assume the day they arrive, they will adapt or integrate or accept the system. So like uh, uh, Sadiq uh, said, uh, Dr. Navid said, I'm sorry, he's so young to me that I keep calling him by his name. So um, um, like he said that, you know, patience, patience is important, but checking our own biases are important. Uh, More on uh, the fact that I think uh, even from Muslim uh, organizations, there are many groups now working on domestic violence. There is actually Imams Against Domestic Violence group that's very active. And uh, khutbas, like you said, khutbas are being done. I just feel that these are being done in silos and we just have to somehow find this cohesive platform. That's the goal with Muslim Mental Health Consortium and the conference. The idea is to bring everyone together at one platform so we don't continue to redo the work that the other person is doing, that we can augment on each other's work. And I do want to just give a shout out to my uh, group. I I work through uh, South Asian Women Association with them, and I'm very grateful for their services in Michigan. So Nubia, can I add one small thing before uh, uh, just adding to uh, what uh, Dr. Abbasi mentioned about being aware of your personal biases uh, and not bringing them? Every one of us have biases and most of them, they stem from our own experiences. So even let's say if I'm seeing a patient or I'm doing therapy for a patient, I, I have my own past, right? So just being aware of that, that you also have a past is not, you know, um, a static relationship. It's not one way process, it's a a dynamic relationship, two way process. So as a therapist, just being aware of that, the the psychology language for that is parallel processes. So just be aware of what else might be going on with you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nabi, I see Brother Ershard's hand is raised. Do you have any comments, Brother Ashif? Yeah, so I, I I wanted to uh, kind of you know we we've been we've been tackling the uh, the, the problem with uh, a lot of the issues that we have within our community, which is a very good thing to do. But I also want to just throw out there that you know our cultures are also very beautiful, right? The the problem is the crossing the line between what is a religious expectation which is about the safety and and benefit of mankind and human beings, right? And so when our cultures cross that line, that that's a no-go. But otherwise, our cultures actually have a lot of beauty and actually a lot of the solutions built right into them. Into uh, we are a very hospitable community, right? Uh, we are a community that when we have guests over, we go out of our way to make sure that we treat those guests in, 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 in the best possible experience they can have. Uh, So there are so many positives in our culture. The only thing we have to do is reframe a lot of these things to our own household, to the members of our own family. And, you know, that's what I was trying to say earlier is, you know, it's unfortunate that we will go out of our way. I mean, it's not unfortunate, but we go out of our way to make sure our guests have a great experience in our house. The first and foremost people that should be having that great experience are the inhabitants of that house. Uh, You know, just like you would go out of your way to accommodate someone uh, a stranger or even a neighbor or, or a guest that is not a permanent fixture in your household, the permanent fixtures in your household get that at that priority. They are they are supposed to get that best treatment from you first. If they're mm-hmm. not, it's hypocritical. Your behavior is hypocritical because you're allowing yourself to behave one way so that you can be seen as as hospitable, but then you're really not if with your family at home, which is why the Prophet uh, ﷺ, he said, uh, uh, he mentioned that, uh, that the best of you are the best in their character. And at the end of that hadith, he specifically he specifically said, وَخِيَارُكُمْ خِيَارُكُمْ لِنِسَائِهِمْ The best of you in character are those who are the best to their wives. Nice. And so he's saying you can act like a great person in front of other people, but how do you treat the people in your own home? That is your real, uh, a real judge of character. So we already have these, these beautiful things in our culture that are built in. We just have to stop... Uh, you know, only uh, using them for strangers or guests or distant family members, etc. We just need to adopt the same view for people in our mm-hmm. house because we have 
very, very uh, beautiful things for our culture as well. It's only when we cross that line and when we start uh, violating religious principles of harming people and taking their rights away and and and, and judge, uh, judging them and, and all that kind of stuff that, that Dr. Faraz mentioned as well. That's where the real problem is. But I think you know, I just want to throw it in there because I don't want us to go down a line of just thinking that everything is wrong with our culture. And I know no one is saying that. But uh, but there are there are problems that exist that we need to solve, and oftentimes within our cultures we can find uh, solutions for that as well. Very true. Um, I see Dr. Naveed um, raising his hand, and we have some comments from the audience as well. So I will just take thirty seconds. I think I, I'm glad that Brother Arshad made this point um, that every culture has so many beautiful things, and then there are some things. Um, that can be troubling and we need to address them heads on. Um, one of the study that was done on attachment st styles, attachment again, you know, just to go back to psychology is the relationship between the caregiver and infant. So they looked at different attachment styles around the world. The most troubling one is disorganized attachment. And the percentage of patient uh, people are, you know, infant uh, parent diet who had disorganized attachment, it was almost similar throughout the world. So most parents, most couples do really good job, even in Pakistan or any other South Asian or Muslim countries, is those fewer that we struggle with and we don't have resources to deal with that. We don't have you know, laws to protect victimized individuals in those in situations. So I, thank you for saying that. I, I really liked it. Thank you, Dr. Ravi, uh, for- uh, Can I add uh, something here? <clears throat> so coming back to, I kind of uh, reiterate this again and again, that uh, my faith, my religion makes me uh, who I am, defines me. And the reason being, it's important for all of us to understand the spirit of Islam, the basic, uh, what Islam was teaching us is enough we know that when we look at uh, the history of psychiatry, that what we are practicing now was taught to us long time before by our own scholars. It's unfortunate that we have walked away. We have just become so ritualistic. We, we just want to do the rituals. We are not taking the spirit and not understanding what Islam really meant when they, we say it's a, it's a, uh, a, a direction for your whole life, for your relationships, for everything. So one thing that Islam talks about integrally is very, uh, to me, is very interesting is that you can be born in a Muslim household, but for you to be a practicing Muslim, you have mm -hmm. to be mentally competent. It's only religion that puts so much emphasis on mental competence. If you look at the Sharia, Preservation of akal is, is right there with preservation of nasal and property and everything else, and preservation of faith. Akal, akal becomes so important in religion that only religion that acknowledges that if you don't have mental competency, then you are much noon, then you are not responsible religious wise, society wise. Actually, society has to take care of you. So if you have the akal, then do everything to preserve that akal. And that's where everything that takes you away from that decision-making capacity or clear mind or clear uh, conscience uh, was prohibited. That's why alcohol was prohibited, that if you're it, if it impacts your uh, akal, then stay away. If anger, stay away. So I think it is so very imperative for us to understand be it Islam, be it culture, that your mental wellness starts with you. And unless an individual takes uh, responsibility of their mental wellness, they will not have healthy relationships. And healthy relationships means you won't have healthy families. And healthy if you don't have healthy families, you don't have healthy community. And then these healthy communities, if they are not do not exist, then there is no healthy society. So Islam started with the drop and took it to the ocean. It started with an individual responsibility and well-being and then took it to the whole society. So I think, uh, again, uh, these, we focus, sometimes focus on the behaviors, the outcomes of not having mental wellness. 
and domestic violence or violence of any kind or anger, these are because you are not well, you are not mentally well, and it impacts your ethical values, spiritual values, social values. So I think we have to bring mental health to the center of our every policy, every practice. Excellent. Yeah, um, there's um, a few comments uh, by Sister Marzia. Um, she is a social worker, um, marriage and family therapist, and author and speaker. She wholeheartedly agrees that we need to collaborate more and not try reinventing the wheel. She would love some more information on the consortium and how Canadians can also join and collaborate. I'm also from Canada, so it's good to see someone from Canada here joining and you know having collaboration for MMHC um, and some of the comments that were there uh, with MMHC the Muslim Mental Health Consortium and the conference I would like to share my experience uh, the conference Dr. Farabasi uh, mentioned and uh, uh, would be ha ha happening again this year in March this, this is how I started my journey I was a poster presenter at the conference and have been part of the consortium um, as a part of the consortium, we were discussing of this event and how that discussion has led to this webinar. Um, so um, I agree that these are the collaborations and how as me, as a young physician, growing into uh, into career, um, understands uh, the religious aspect of uh, addressing issues. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, um, all the attendees for joining us today. Thank you for wonderful interactions and questions and in insightful sessions. We try to send out the follow-up email with the resources that have been shared with us. And I would like to thank all the panelists for your time, for uh, wonderful insights uh, there. If there's any, if every, if there's any any last comments from the uh, from the panelists, otherwise we would. College. I would just I like to, uh, on behalf of the Ekna Relief uh, team, the staff, and everyone to thank all the panelists uh, for a wonderful, mashallah, presentation. We learned a lot from your presentations and not that I forget the moderator, Nabi has done all the work for this uh, great webinar. And the person we don't see here behind the scenes Mary. is still here. Mary has been Firdausi with us for many years. And Mary, we can't do it without you. And we know that you put in so much uh, time and effort into all of this. We uh, learned a lot from today's webinar and hope to do more in coming months. We hope inshallah that at least perhaps once every quarter is something that we could do in terms of our collaboration with Ikna Relief and the consortium. We'll continue to do this again. Thank you all very much. Salaam alaikum. Salaam. Thank you, everyone. Rabia, can you share my email so sure. I can to the audience? Thank you so much, everyone. Jazakallah. Thank you.